for those of you that haven't seen the bio, um, Alvin Bartels is a policy advisor and works for the National Institute of Public Health and the Environment. Um, he's got particular expertise in Legionella. Um, he's been involved in the implementation of prevention at buildings um, in Amsterdam. He's also written prevention guidelines and for community health services. Um, and he's um, a member of a number of committees and groups that meet uh, to discuss um, Legionella prevention. And so, um, Alvin, we appreciate it very much. If you can't hear us, you can ask. Um, after your presentation, we'll have some Q&A from the committee. Okay, thank you. And thank you for this nice uh, introduction. Um, I will start my presentation. Um, in the Netherlands, we have uh, four regulations for Legionella prevention. And these were all made after uh, two outbreaks. And the first outbreak we had in the Netherlands was in uh, 1999. Uh, we had an outbreak uh, during a flora event in Bova Gospo. It's a small town, uh, approximately 60 kilometers uh, north of Amsterdam. And it was due to a hot tub uh, on display. And more than 200 people were diagnosed with lesionous disease and 32 people died. Of course, you can imagine it's uh, got a lot of media coverage and also some political demands for regulations. So we they added uh, regulations to the Drinking Water Act, the Hygiene and Safety Act for swimming and bathing facilities, and also uh, the Safety at Work Act for uh, so workers weren't exposed anymore to Legionella. Uh, but in 2006, we got another outbreak, this time in Amsterdam near Central Station, and this time it was a cooling tower, a temporarily placed cooling tower, uh, um, and more than 30 people were diagnosed with Legionella's disease and three people died. And they added uh, uh, Legionella regulations to the Environmental Protection Act. Um, oddly enough, the regulation for hot tubs used at defense is still lacking. So the hot tub on display, uh, we don't have any regulations for, this, for that in, at this moment. All regulations are for Legionella species. And we have no similar regulations for other opportunistic pathogens in water systems. Although in swimming pools, you have to monitor uh, pseudomonas. And keep in mind, we have no chlorination in the Dutch drinking water system. Um, first, the Drinking Water Act. Uh, the legal owners of the drinking water system have to make a risk assessment, and they have to make a management plan, and they have to record all their action in a logbook, and they have to assess uh, the risk if there are any aerosols present for showers, example. Uh, are there any uh, risk with temperature between 25 and 55 degrees Celsius? Uh, is there any stagnation uh, for more than one week? And also, is there a lack of proper maintenance? Uh, for example, dead legs or uh, showers that are not used anymore. This is also part of our building regulations that is in the NEN 1006. And the uh, owner of the drinking water system has to update the risk assessment if the drinking water system has changed significantly, uh, for example, more showers were added. Now, these this, uh, regulations are only for priority premises, and these are uh, hospitals, healthcare facilities with overnight stay, hotels, vacation sites, bed and breakfast for more than five persons, swimming pools, harbors, marinas with showering facilities, truck stops with showering facilities, asylum centers, and prison. And this list is based on our own list we make, uh, uh, and a list with water systems with increased risk for leachinase disease. And we based this uh, classification on five criteria. Uh, one is linked to cases of leachinase disease. The other one is travel accommodation, dispersion of aerosols to the environment, and especially continuously dispersion of aerosols like cooling towers, exposure of population from risk groups like the elderly or people with weakened immune systems, and temporary used installations, for example, at events. And for this list, we used peer reviewed publications and Dutch matches and, matches and clusters. And as mentioned, these are the priority premises uh, mentioned in the Drinking Water Act. 
Then the management plan, uh, the control methods, if you want to use a control method, uh, we, they use a step metal uh, in the Drinking Water Act. The first step is you yeah, can use temperature control and flushing and heat disinfection, or you can use an ultraviolet filtration uh, system. Um, and if the water management company can prove that uh, this is not uh, sufficient enough, you can go to the second step, that's uh, electrochemical, for example, copper silver ionization. And in theory, we can go to the third step, the chlorination of the drinking water. But to my knowledge, that has never been approved by the inspectorate. Uh, you also have to monitor your control methods. Uh, if you use the temperature control and flushing method, uh, you have to check your temperature. The cold water needs to be 25 or lower, and the warm water needs to be 60 degrees or higher. And you have to sample every, uh, you have to take culture, you have to sample every six months, and you have to sample the taps that are most distant from the water meter or most distant for the boiler, or uh, taps that are not used very often. And you have to, uh, to use the culture method, the Dutch culture method, the NEN 6265. And uh, also uh, recently we updated and we have now the international standard that can also be used. And next year it will only be the international standard 11731. The threshold is less than 100 uh, colon colony forming units per liter. And if you're above 100, you have to take action and lower your concentration. And if you, the concentration is above 1,000 CFU per liter, you have to report to the inspectorate. Um, and they will give a reply, and you have to take action to get below the threshold. And, it, and then if you got it below the threshold, you have to notify the inspectorate. You, um, there are also certificates needed. Um, if you want to make a risk assessment or a management plan, you have, to be, you have to have a certificate, the BRL 6010. So only professional water consultancy firms, uh, firms are making these risk assessment and management plans. And if you want to use a control method other than flushing, you want to use ultraviolet filtration, you have to have a product certificate that's called the BRL 14010-1. If you want to use the electrochemical method, you have to have a certificate BRL 14010-2. And to make uh, a an, uh, risk assessment and a uh, management plan, you have technical guidelines available. This one is called the ISO 55.1. The second act is the Hygiene and Safety Act for Swimming and Bathing Facilities. Uh, the Dutch abbreviation is the BHVBC. And you only need to uh, uh, do lacunae like prevention measures if the location is built to be used as a swimming and bathing facility. And one of the baths is at least two square meters wide and one and a half a meter deep. And at least one bath disperses aerosols, for example, hot tub or play fountains. Keep in mind, this does not apply, apply to hot tubs on display or in hotel rooms or at the event because it's not a swimming and bathing facility. Um, you also have to make a risk assessment, you have to make a management plan and record all your action in a logbook. You have to use an effective disinfection method. Uh, monitoring is needed. Uh, the threshold is uh, similar as drinking water systems below 100 colony forming units per liter. Uh, but no culture method is specified. You only need to use an accredited, accredited uh, laboratory. And you have to report to the province authority if it's uh, 100 CFU per liter or more. Uh, but no certificates are needed to make a risk assessment or management plan so the swimming or bathing facility can make their own risk assessment. And uh, also you don't need to update your risk assessment, but the inspectorate can demand a new risk assessment or an update. To my knowledge, there are no technical guidelines available for making a risk assessment or a management plan. Uh, third, the Environmental Protection Act, it's only for wet cooling towers. Again, you have to make a risk assessment you have to uh, uh, assess if there is biofilm forming, sediment, uh, the temperature, stagnation, and you have to uh, make a management plan and uh, record all your action in a logbook. 
you have to use an effective water treatment. It doesn't state what kind of effective what, what kind of water treatment you have to use, as long as it's effective and it's allowed to use in the Netherlands. Um, then you have to monitor uh, your cooling tower. If it's it has to be clean, also the cooling water needs to be clean. But there is uh, no threshold and also no frequency specified. Uh, but if it's mentioned in a management, if a threshold and or frequency is mentioned in a management plan, you have to use this threshold or frequency. And you have to update your risk assessment when the cooling tower operation changes or the surroundings change. For example, there is another cooling tower placed on the location or a hospital is going to be built next door. And there are no certificates required to make a risk assessment or management plan or to use the water treatment. Uh, but you do have to uh, report uh, placing a cooling tower if it's after January 2010. It has to be reported to the authority and for most cooling towers, that's the municipality. Some large industrial sites, it can be the province authority. Uh, but if it's uh, before January 2010, uh, the authority has to find these cooling towers for themselves. And it's uh, real hard to do. And so at, at the moment, uh, based on uh, the water treatment industry numbers, we have uh, one third of the cooling towers registered. And to make a risk assessment and management plan, there are technical guidelines available. This is called the ISO 55.3 and the AR32. And on the fourth one is the Safety at Work Act to protect workers from exposure to Legionella species during the work. Uh, again, you have to make a risk assessment. You also have to make some sort of a management plan. This is part of the health and safety catalog, but uh, it's not specified what kind of preventive methods you have to use to protect workers from exposure to Legionella. Uh, that is something for the company to decide for themselves. And if no certificates are required. And uh, the threshold is set at uh, less than 100 uh, CV uh, per liter. It's the same for the drinking water and the bathing facilities. But no frequencies are spe specified, only that you need a standard culture method. And there are no regular inspectors from the national uh, inspectorate. Um, they only check if you have a health and safety catalog, and that's it. And, and implementation and compliance is the responsibility of the sector or the brand's organization. And to make this risk assessment, there is a technical guideline available. This is the AI 32 again. I made an overview of all the water systems and, and, and acts available. Uh, the drinking water systems, only priority premises. It's uh, The last update was in 2011. Um, uh, Legionella canovola and 20 other pathogenic species uh, need to be monitored. Well, um, normally it's all species, but because no lab is monitoring these 20 specific pathogenic species. Um, the threshold is at set at 100 CFU per liter. And you have to use, for, for now, the Dutch 6265, but it will be the international standard 11731. And you have to sample every six months. You have to notify the authority if it's above uh, 1000 CFU, and for control methods, you need, you need to use the step model. And flushing and thermal disinfection is the most used control method in the Netherlands. And you have to have uh, certificates for making a management plan and to use other methods than flushing. And the authority is the human environment and transport inspectorate. Uh, and also for local inspections, uh, we have the water supply companies. Then bathing facilities since 2000 is for all the channel species. Threshold is set at 100, frequency is six months, notification 100 or more. You can use any effective method uh, as long as it's allowed in the Netherlands. Uh, no certificates, uh, certificates necessary, and the authority is the province authority. Cooling towers since 2010 for all these genetic species. No threshold, no frequency, no notification necessary. Only you have to report cooling towers that are placed uh, after January 2010. And you can use any effective water treatment method as long as it's allowed uh, in the Netherlands. And you don't need any certificates. And there are a, a number of authorities. The most, for most cooling towers, it's the municipalities. 
with some large industrial sites at the province authorities and local inspectors are done by environmental protection agencies. And then the last one is the safety at work. It's since 2007 for all Legionella species, threshold is set at 100, no frequency specified, no notification, you can use any effective method, no certificates are required, and yeah, the inspectorate, the national inspectorate only, uh, like I said, it checks if there is a health and safety plan. So it's the responsibility of your own branch organization. I've uh, got some numbers from uh, the, in, the drinking water uh, system inspector, the ILT, about implementation. Unfortunately, the, the, the numbers are in Dutch, but it says uh, in red, uh, there is no good compliance and uh, Legionella uh, is uh, increased, it's likely there, is, there should be Legionella. Green, there is, uh, it means it's, it's very good compliance and it's not likely to find Legionella in the water system. Yellow is slightly increased and orange it's a bit increased, a bit more increased. Um, so, and on the bottom, you see the number of hospitals that are inspected by this national inspectorate. Um, uh, uh, every year, it's our different hospitals. Some, uh, maybe some are uh, similar hospitals. And you see the, the percentages change every year. So there is still some room for improvement um, and yeah, for uh, implementation. Same for healthcare centers. It's a bit better, um, the compliance, and more than 50% is uh, uh, good. Uh, we won't expect any Legionella in these drinking water systems, but still there are 12%. Uh, uh, it's expected that uh, there are Legionella in the drinking water system. Uh, data for swimming pools, it's only for drinking water systems, a little bit less than the uh, healthcare centers, uh, uh, below 50% complete compliance and almost 20% um, yeah, bad compliance and likely to have Legionella in their drinking water system. And keep in mind that the ILT doesn't take uh, samples themselves, it's only on paper based on the management plan. And the sauna and wellness of special interest to us because we have a lot of patients in sauna and wellness and as you can see there is much room for improvement uh, for these facilities. Only, uh, yeah, you see that uh, in, uh, last year in 2017, they visited, they inspected 25 sauna and wellness centers in 2016, 51. 2016 was a better year. And in 2017, it's again below 50% complete compliance and 28% uh, bad compliance and likely to have Legionella bacteria. So much improvement for the implementation needed. Uh, hotels, um, similar numbers, and this the good compliance is very low. Last year, uh, 689 hotels were inspected, and only 36.3% 30, had complete compliance, and um, about 90% had very bad compliance. So, also much improvement needed. And the last one is the bed and breakfast for more, for more than five persons, um, even worse numbers. Um, a, a third uh, have good compliance and a third have very bad compliance in last year and 99 bed and breakfast location were visited. Now the implementation uh, from cooling towers, unfortunately we don't have any recent data available about the implementation on, and compliance. Also the positive environmental samples are not registered. Um, I have some old data from 2011, uh, the government did a survey and asked all municipalities if they check for the presence of cooling towers. They had a response of 84%, it's about 350 municipalities. And 88% of these municipalities said they checked for the presence of cooling towers, but 56% said they didn't have any cooling towers, 53% inspected cooling towers, and roughly 30% of the locations did not comply with the regulation. Now keep in mind these are old numbers, uh, more municipalities have cooling towers than the 56% that's now that's um, noted here. 
And in 2015, we did a small survey. Um, we asked 14 inspectorates uh, about their uh, experience with uh, inspecting the management plans and registration. And they say about 30% of all crew towers are registered. And two thirds of the interviewed inspectorates do not visually inspect the cooling towers. So they, can, they do not check if the cooling tower is clean and the cooling water is clean, although it's mentioned in the regulations. And that is because they, lack, they have lack of time and lack of knowledge about the cooling tower. And they hope to improve this knowledge in the coming years. Um, implementation about bathing facilities. There are no national registered uh, numbers about how good the implementation is for bathing facilities. I asked some province authorities and generally large swimming pools facilities, the compliance is generally good and small bathing facilities like vacation homes or bed and breakfast, uh, compliance is, it has, to be, has to be improved. And uh, Safety at Work Act, I don't have any data available because it's not registered by the National Inspectorate. Now, how enforceable is the regulation? All regulations except the Safety at Work Act do regular inspections. First, they will give warnings. If that doesn't help, they can give fines, many thousands of years if necessary. And in theory, they can close the water system, but it really depends on the health risk. Well, in the Safety at Work Act, again, the inspectorate only checks if a health and safety catalog is present. Unfortunately, there are no regulations for uh, risk systems according to our list for mist systems, decorative fountains, hot tubs at events, and hotel rooms. So they are also not enforceable. Although municipality can impose local regulation. Did the regulations have any effects? Um, unfortunately, I don't have any data from uh, environmental hits. Uh, the, these uh, samples are all done by the commercial labs and I don't have their uh, data. I tried to get the notification data from the inspectorate of the drinking water facilities and uh, bathing facilities, uh, but I don't have it available at this moment. Maybe I can send you this information later. Um, then if you look at the Legionnaire's disease notification in the Netherlands, 2007-2017, and the red bars uh, represent the domestic cases and the blue bars uh, represent the travel abroad cases. Uh, the travel abroad cases are similar over the years, uh, around 130 ca 40 cases in the Netherlands, uh, and uh, uh, domestic cases in the Netherlands uh, uh, rise uh, between 2000 and 2017, and the highest number was in 2017 around 400 cases. And if you look at this figure, you can uh, conclude that all these re regulations do not uh, have any impact, have not any effect. But um, unfortunately, we can say which regulations do have any effect because we, at the moment we have insufficient data to compare Legionnaire's disease notifications with the effect of regulations. There are limited sampling of potential sources and few clinical isolates available for comparison. We only have a couple of matches uh, each year. And most matches are found at hospital and healthcare settings, wellness and spa pools. The source of infection uh, remains unknown for most notification. Um, and overall, overall, you can say that if you combine all regulations, they do not have any effect on uh, uh, decreasing the LD rates. We think there is an association with rainfall, and so there might be other environmental sources that are not in the current regulations. Are there any efforts in place to monitor the impact of regulations? Uh, uh, yeah, we need more data to, uh, uh, to monitor the impact of regulations. Uh, together with the municipal health service, we try to improve the number of matches and we try to find new sources of infection. Uh, for example, a couple of years ago, we uh, sampled uh, bioscrubbers at uh, pig farms, 36 bioscrubbers. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any Legionella. Um, um, and unknown is if the national government have plans to monitor the impact of regulations. Not in uh, this year or next year, they don't have any plans. Um, and last, we want to uh, have a possible research. We 
uh, are current regulations for drinking water systems effective compared to new insights in controlling Legionella growth? Because the drinking water regulation is already in effect since 2011. And of course, there are new insights in controlling Legionella growth and we want to compare these uh, data. And hopefully um, your conclusions and recommendations uh, can help us answering this question. Thank you for your attention. This was my presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> That's uh, very interesting in terms of the increased cases, but we're seeing similar trends that you can't find the source yes, of many of these cases domestically. No, so, we can't find it. Um, yeah, so let's start on this side of the room and then we'll go around. Questions here now? Ruth, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. It was really insightful. Um, you mentioned a lack of time and knowledge related to cooling towers, and I wasn't sure what you meant by knowledge of cooling towers. Um, was that knowledge of where they were or registration or knowledge of what to do with them? And the, um, the second oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, now, uh, the technical knowledge, um, because uh, environmental protection agencies uh, did not inspect the cooling towers before uh, 2010. Uh, they didn't even know what cooling towers were. So they, they really have to uh, school them, themselves. Okay, the second question is, how do you assess the competency of the environmental lab to culture for um, Legionella and quantify it? Would you repeat that because I can't hear? Oh, how, I'm, I'm wondering about the environmental laboratories that culture for Legionella and how do yep. you assess their competency um, both for identifying it and for quantifying it? Well, Did you hear that? Alvin, that's just I think I understand that. I think, yeah, I think I, I okay. Um, um, yeah, we, we did some some tests. Uh, at, uh, what I can remember many years ago, and you see differences between the the, the all the commercial laboratories. But I don't know uh, what the quality is for uh, of these labs. Unfortunately, I don't have any numbers. Uh, sorry, I can't answer them for this moment. Okay, but there you. is some differences in quality. Steve? Um, a similar question I asked the last speaker is, um, how is Legionella testing happening in hospitals within the Netherlands itself? Because part of the question comes up is, are we seeing increasing rates because of testing changes? because of better identification in communities? Or is this truly an increase? Or are we better at identifying um, cases that we didn't um, identify in the past? Has that changed over these past few years? Um, you're talking about environmental samples, right? No, I'm, I'm no in, about, in clinical, uh, clinical samples. Clinical, clinical samples. samples. Yeah, yeah. Are, are, is the diagnosis getting better or, is, or do you have a sense that the cases are really increasing? Um, yeah, the cases really are increasing. I, I don't think the, the diagnosis is is is, uh, was, is better these couple of two years or three years. It, it's as similar compared to three or four years ago. And and what what method are you using for clinical diagnosis now in um, sporadic cases that come into labs or in hospitals? Are they different or are they similar around the uh, around the nation or so, uh, unfortunately, I don't have this detailed information, but to my knowledge, it's no different than five years ago. Steve, did you have a follow-up question? No. Okay. Uh, Nick? Uh, yes, I, I want a point of clarification. In your slide 20 showing the uh, increasing in domestic I just want clarity on what you define as domestic because uh, I assume 
you're not talking about individual households, but you're talking about hospitals, institutions, and the bed and breakfast hotels that you referred to under the Act. Is that what you're referring to as domestic? We're talking about a clinic. Can I go to the slides or slide 20? Is there clinical Thank you. cases? Right? Oh, no. <clears throat> Four see. slides back. Yeah. Because the, the title of the slide is Are Regulations Having an Effect? And I'm just wanting clarity what the, the re, your current regulations, as I understand it, do not address household domestic. They're to do with institutional. No, 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 uh, right. No, and and uh, the, the number of cases that we have some. Uh, cases, uh, domestic, uh, domestic cases in households, but um, a, a couple. But as I mentioned, we only have a few matches. Oh. We only have a few matches each year. So, and uh, yes, we have a couple of households, uh, matches with households. Nick, Maybe I think that thing was travel associated versus domestically acquired. So the, the, best, the, the figure that had domestically acquired cases, that's all cases, no matter what. Yeah, no matter what, what. it's all the cases. Yeah. yeah, all cases combined. Mm. All notification. Okay. You need to be notified uh, to the RVM, and these are all cases. All right. And could you clarify this apparent relationship with rainfall? What actual data are you referring to? Um, yeah, that's data from my colleague, Peter Bronsema, uh, and she uh, found a correlation between rainfall and, uh, and the, the number of cases rising in a, a certain period. It's a, uh, um, a, a warm period followed by a wet period. In the wet period, you see a rise in the number of cases. And if you want the numbers, I can give you these numbers. Uh, I have to contact my colleague, uh, Peter Bronsema. Uh, thank you. So there's this association. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Chuck, and then we're going to go to Michelle. Michelle. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that one of the regulations on the, <clears throat> I guess, drinking water side, presumably for hospitals, is a hot water temperature of 60 degrees C. Where is that measured? Yeah, that, that's uh, the the temperature of the hot water uh, hot water storage uh, tank or the boiler, and uh, uh, also the recycle uh, line. But of course, they have the thermostatic valves that are set at well around 35. So it's not measured at the thermostatic valves; it's measured at a couple of points. But the hot water, if they want to do uh, heat disinfection, it has to reach. 60 degrees, also on thermostatic so valves, if necessary. The hot water return line has to be 60? Yes. Yeah. How do you get, keep that hot? Well, they try to, low, to try to lower the temperature, and if, uh, I think for if they don't have a return, uh, you said they, they, then it can be uh, 55, but it has to be 60 in uh, uh, in hospitals, for example. In hospitals specifically? No, not only in hospitals. Okay. In every drinking water system in the Netherlands, basically. Okay. Um, we have another question from a member online, Michelle Provo. Michelle, go ahead. She's probably getting off mute right now. Oh, I am off mute. There you go. We hear you now. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, a question of clarification for slide 20. So you responded that that includes community acquired cases, in all cases right. in the Netherlands, is that correct? Yeah, that's all cases, yes. Go to number. And uh, would you, um, would, would you uh, comment on whether the community acquired cases are monitored with the same, to the same extent as uh, what you call sensitive um, groups or installations or buildings uh, like hotels and hospitals. Do you think that 
the current surveillance system would pick up the community acquired uh, cases as well. Um, can you clarify your question because yeah, you have a, a total number of yeah. of, uh, of cases, and you mentioned right. that they include very few uh, what you would call household or community right. acquired mm -hmm. type of cases in in households. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that the Dutch uh, surveillance of of um, sporadic cases from the community uh, would pick up these cases? Yeah, uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, I don't have any doubt that, no. that the, the would, would would do the same level of surveillance then. In same, the yeah, yeah, we have we have a, a, a surveillance team, and we do a, a source finding, and it doesn't matter where uh, a patient, uh, where, if it's a household or a, a hospital right. or, or whatever, um, we try to find the source. If it's if the patient uh, only stayed in their house, we don't do any source investigation. But if it's, uh, there's likely source outside of their house, we do a source investigation. Okay, that really helps. Um, I noticed the, uh, and that was a very clear presentation on the different regulations that have been promulgated in the Netherlands. Um, yeah. Would you also comment on design uh, specifications for plumbing. I, I do believe that you have a few uh, very progressive design obligations that limit, for example, the number, the length and the volumes of piping um, uh, that yeah, do not have true. recirculation in hot water system. Do you think those regulations and guidance are important? I, um, I will say this. Um, not all of them, I think. Uh, we have a lot of, yeah, a lot of uh, um, things that, you, that, that the plumbing system has to comply with. Uh, I don't know uh, um, um, if all these measurements and all these, if it's one meter or a fi uh, a half a meter, if that really will help to avoid uh, the formation of biofilm, to my personal opinion. Okay, so you're, you don't, in your opinion, you don't think that those uh, guidance uh, contributed a lot to, to the uh, levels uh, that you see right now? Uh, no, well, maybe some, but it's not, uh, um, um, how you say it, um, a little bit, but I don't think it's, it's, it's really uh, the key thing to, to, to avoid biofilm formation. Uh, I also noticed that uh, you mentioned the uh, step approach for treatment uh, whenever levels of ex are exceeded, uh, reference levels. So I have two questions for that. The first one is, um, how were the levels of 100 and 1,000 CFU per liter set? Uh, were they uh, related to risk or were they operational levels? How did the Netherlands decide on these levels? Purely operation, purely uh, pure practical. Um, um, 100 is, uh, is seen as the, the detection limit for all laboratories, and 1,000 is uh, it was only set because the inspector didn't want to have uh, too much of a <laughs> notification. <laughs> so it's purely <laughs> operation. Practical. <laughs> yeah, practical indeed. <laughs> And the second question is more about treatment, where, where this is the part of the support I'll be working more on. Um, I did notice that you rely on either UV filtration or um, 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 thermal disinfection. Have you um, monitored how effective thermal shock treatment is for disinfection <coughs> in the Dutch systems? Um, well, I think the, uh, Paul van der Wiele and KBR uh, did some research, but it's not f from the government side, it's not monitored at this okay. moment. And, and then a final sub question, you did mention that you were not aware of any systems that had to go to step three, which is uh, chemical disinfection, mm -hmm. chlorine, actually. 
Um, so there are no, I was under the impression that um, some hospitals did use on-site chlorination when things were difficult to handle. Is that a, can you confirm that in your, to the best of your knowledge, there are no chemical treatment installed in Dutch systems? Well, there uh, are used if, if uh, there are increased, uh, is an increased concentration of Legionella present, you can use uh, chemical disinfection for shock treatment uh, to, to eliminate the Legionella bacteria from your drinking water system. But to my knowledge, it's not something that is continuously used as a, as a control method. But maybe there are some hospitals that I don't know of that use this, this method. And I have one last question. I just saw on my list, I was writing up as you were presenting. Um, I, I see a much lesser focus on the obligations for uh, cooling tower monitoring. Uh, is that choice in the Dutch regulations um, a, based on the fact that your assessment of local sources is, is not really like cooling towers are not so important? Or is it because you had so much regulations by the time you got to cooling towers that there was a push against too much monitoring regulations? Well, you, you hit the nail on the head with the last one <laughs> because that's, that's it. They want to have, uh, it's, it's, it's a trend in the Netherlands to have less regulations. Uh, so they, uh, uh, during that time, they want to have less regulations uh, um, than uh, drinking. And we would like to see a more strict regulation on cooling towers. For example, a mention, a threshold, mention a, a frequency. So you can also inspect on this uh, threshold and frequency. But uh, at the moment, there are no plans to, to change this. Thank you. Uh, Amy Pruden has a question for you. Hi, I actually have two questions. Um, with the first, I feel I have to address the elephant in the room of not adding secondary chlorine or chloramine disinfectant residual. Right, so, I mean, are people frankly assessing whether that's playing a significant role in these increased cases? Is there any discussion about more of a role of disinfectant? No, there is no discussion about it because they're very strict, especially the drinking water supply companies, they don't want any uh, chlorination in, in the drinking water system. So uh, there is no discussion that uh, no, no, to use this more often in, in drinking water system. Okay, well, it seems it's a demonstrated control measure in many other locales. So it just seems important to consider. But then, and then yeah, and how well, long have the Dutch systems been without chlorination? They're never been. Uh, I think they have never been chlorinated, the, the, the drinking no, water system. not for at least 25 years. So the recent yeah. increases, um, I don't think, can be related to the lack of chlorine. I no, no. And, 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 and uh, the, the, the drinking water uh, supply companies, they check their, their uh, distribution system, and it's always uh, below the 100 uh, CFU per liter. Um, so it's 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 yeah the, the growth uh, the Legionella growth is within the drinking water systems and there are other alternatives to eliminate the Legionella bacteria I think. So Amy, what was your second um, question? So the second question was about the regulations related to bathing waters, and I thought that was was interesting and and fairly unique the focus on that. Um, so I was wondering if it's largely reactionary, since there was a, a large outbreak related to the, the hot tub. Um, and if, if it's being found that those measures are effective um, and, and what the future is and the focus in that area. Um, it is a reaction on the outbreak, but uh, strangely enough, uh, the, 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 the cause of the outbreak is not part of this bathing uh, facilities act. Um, I don't, I, I try to get some numbers from the, uh, the province authority uh, and they say that some provinces uh, uh, authorities, uh, they only see a couple of 
positive samples, but there is another province that's, that it's, it has dozens of positive water samples uh, notifications. And, but I can't say if it's working or I like that data. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Nick Ashball. Uh, given the Dutch uptake of using QMRA, uh, work of Jack Scheiben at RIVM, I'm thinking of here, and your use of water safety plans in the Dutch version for managing drinking water systems. My question is, are you or have you considered using qPCR Legionella testing as a measure of change, given that we're less interested in absolute concentrations but a, a trend up or down in water safety plan management targeting? I'm just wondering what the discussion has been in the Netherlands. Yeah, um, there's a lot of discussion about this, uh, but, um, and the, 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 the culture method is only used as an indication if the control method is working, and, and that, that's it. And also, um, if the levels are exceeded, uh, you get a, a quite a big reaction. Um, water systems are closed, uh, you get press releases, this all ha is happening and I'm afraid if you use qPCR, the number of positive samples will increase and, and of course, is this a dead or alive, uh, 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 are these bacteria dead or alive, so that's also a discussion. Um, so we are a bit wary of using qPCR as a monitoring method, a monitoring tool for monitoring the control methods. Okay, thank you. So I have a question um, from um, an individual in the health department. I think it's Connecticut Health Department um, on, from online. And they want to know whether you're, you've got any reports or how much effort is being made to um, uh, match up isolates in the environment with the cases, isolates from cases? Yeah, well, uh, we try to do that, of course, but the problem is we don't have much isolates, uh, clinical isolates. Um, we try to get more clinical mm -hmm. isolates from the hospitals, yeah. but it's, that's, that's the main problem. Uh, and yeah. we hope to increase that. And of course, if we have both isolates, we'll try to match them. Right, so it's, it's pretty similar to what we're hearing with other, other individuals yeah. who try to do those investigations. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't get um, in your slides that you sent, we didn't get those bar graphs you um, showed with the trend over time with um, uh, as you implemented the rules of compliance, I guess it was compliance yes, with the regulations. Yes, 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 compliance. Yeah, and that'd be quite interesting to get those um, graphs if you wouldn't mind sending that PowerPoint again to Remy. Um, but my question was about where you're monitoring um, as you're trying to assess um, implementation and compliance. Where, where are they taking the samples? Is it from bathroom taps, showers, um, you know, or is it, is it, is it randomized? How, how are they sampling? Well, the inspectorate uh, doesn't sample anything. They just check uh, if you're uh, following uh, the regulations, uh, if your log, bo uh, log book is, is correct. Um, and uh, only the, the, so the, the legal owner of the drinking water system has to sample every six months and they have to sample uh, distant taps, taps that are not used very often. Uh, basically the taps that you expect to have Legionella. So distal depends. taps and uh, like from sinks and right and, sinks, um, showers, yeah. And as, uh, I don't um, other members know more about this, and maybe they can uh, ask the question uh, more uh, succinctly than me. But I'm I'm wondering about I guess there's mixing valves and there's different kinds of taps um, that. Um, you might influence aerators, all kinds of things that might influence what you find at the tap. Uh, is there any um, approach that you use to try to understand that, those differences in the plumbing or in the coding around? Yeah, it's a, it's around a good the question. 
Yeah, and it should, should be, it, it, it should do it, but uh, it's not in the regulations. Uh, I don't know, I can speak of every lab taking an environmental sample, but uh, basically it, it, it can be done by a regular tap or a mixing valve. They can uh, uh, shower, they can choose whatever. Right, okay, very good, thank you. And, and my understanding is they don't really have to report to you unless it's over that threshold of CFUs, then you get notification. Otherwise, what do people do with the data? They, it just comes back to them from the lab and they store it in a notebook or something? That's what I do. And uh, if there is a threshold uh, for, for drinking water uh, and systems and uh, bathing facilities, they have to take action to get it below the threshold again. So if they don't do it and there is an inspection by the, uh, the national inspector, um, then they can get the warning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Steve, uh, you had a, a follow-up question. Yeah, as a follow-up to that, um, since you have a national healthcare system, are there specific <laughs> regulations that um, for testing, the number of testing sites, et cetera, in hospitals, or is that also sort of open to interpretation? Do you have specific policies for how hospitals have to do this in comparison to other community buildings where water is available? Um, well, that the hospitals have uh, have to follow the regulation, use the, the, the same uh, standard method. But I do know that hospitals uh, use their own methods for uh, environmental culturing. Um, but yeah, they they they, really, um, they have to uh, comply with the regulations that states you have to use the, the Dutch standard or the international standard. Um, I hope that I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, so it it sounds like it's a little bit varied per hospital. They have yeah, maybe some basic guidelines they have to follow, but not. Um, number of sites or methodologies that they have to use specifically. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the number of sites they have to sample yeah. uh, uh, specified in, in regulations. I don't have the exact numbers, but uh, the larger the, 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 the drinking water system, the more samples you have to take. Okay, all right, thank you. And Elvin, it's John Lutzen. How is that, um, how is compliance with any of these regula regulations uh, monitored or checked or reported by any of the regulatory authorities? Um, the, 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 the figures I showed from the, for being the drinking water system? Yes. Um, and well, the bar graphs you showed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 well, the inspectorate uh, uh, visits on location or the drinking water supply company visits on location and they check the management plan, they check the uh, uh, log notes, um, and uh, if it complies with the regulations, and if it not, doesn't comply with the regulations, uh, they have to change this. And uh, yeah, that, then they classify it in increased risk, or very increased risk, j just like I showed you uh, in, this, uh, in these figures. And, and so the compliance is based on uh, a self-reporting mechanism. It's not necessarily a, uh, in other words, if they don't self-report it to you, you guys don't check them. No, no, it's not, not, uh, no, it's not self, they, uh, the, the inspectorate is visiting the location. So it's not uh, only the, 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 the uh, environmental samples above 1,000, uh, see if you have to be reported, but not the compliance or, uh, or anything like that. That's, that's uh, cluster inspections by the inspectorate. So you actually have people who are personally going out to the to the hospitals to, to, to verify. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or hotels. But or I, I, I guess. Yeah. I'm sorry. The follow-up question was how how often do they physically go to the site? Well, um, I don't know if you, but. Uh, um, in, in a, below the bars, there were this, uh, it stated wh how many locations they visited each year. So uh, healthcare centers, uh, hundreds, uh, hospitals mm -hmm. around uh, 70. So that's what they visit, visit each year. Okay. Great, thank you.
I think so. We're we're good. We really appreciate your time, and this was very um, very useful. And um, and and thank you, Alan, for for that presentation.